If you have somebody who habitually looks for what's wrong and tries to fix it, they're going to organize their personal life very differently from someone who makes, who makes ideas of what could be and pursues those. And you know, again, people don't necessarily think, oh, am I moving away from unpleasantness or am I moving towards things that are awesome? To the extent that you can start to understand your behavior patterns and where you are, get, where, which behavior patterns and which thought patterns give you what you want and which ones get in the way of what you want, there is a degree to which, and I don't believe it's as malleable as some people believe, but there's a degree to which you can rewire how you approach certain things so that you can make up for your natural deficiencies or if you know where your strengths are and actually even getting into the idea of what's a strength and what's a deficiency is a whole other question um, because something that can be a strength can also be a weakness. It just depends upon where you're applying it, what you're trying to do. But knowing those things about yourself, you can either partner with people who compliment you or you can seek to develop the other strategy, you know, the other side of, of the coin. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the beautiful Cambridge, Massachusetts. We are now gonna be talking about turning your big picture into action. We have Steve Robbins joining us on the show. Hello. Hello. Thank, Thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank you for having me here. I'm super pumped. Also very grateful to Luke Saber for introducing us. And I'm so pumped because Stever's background is epic. He's a renaissance man, executive coach, author, speaker, and veteran of nine startups and four IPOs. He co-developed the Foundations module of the Harvard MBA program. You can find steverrobbins.com, link in the bio. Also, itunes.com forward slash get it done guy, his podcast. And you can find get it done guy on Facebook and Twitter as well. All those links are in the bio. Stever, let's start things off with our one of our favorite questions to ask. We love asking people about what their thoughts are on the direction of our world. Oh. I'm afraid I'm a cynic. I'm a very happy cynic, but I'm a cynic. I think we, on many, many fronts, are headed in a bad direction, frankly. We, we're doing well. The human race is in many ways, by many measurements, we have never done so well as a race. We have less violence. We have more health. People are living longer. Uh, it's certainly in aggregate, we have more prosperity. We have fewer people living in poverty. A lot of indicators are really wonderful. Unfortunately, I, and I figured this out actually just a couple days ago. I tend to look much less at where we are than where we're headed. And I do this pretty much everywhere. And in terms of the human race, I look at things like how are we doing with respect to the environment? Do we have an economy that is sustainable? Are we making progress on things like human rights, which we are uh, at the moment? Um, you know, and where do I think we're going to be 10 years from now? And one of my big worries, my big concerns is that some of the biggest problems we have, things like global warming, uh, things like income inequality, and, and in particular wealth inequality, not necessarily income inequality, although obviously they're tied. I think these things are reaching a point and, and a direction where they're going to be big problems. And we can predict now that they're gonna be big, big problems. It's just if we predict it and don't act on it, they will be even bigger problems. And we are, we are not acting as hard as we can, <laughs> you know? Um, so unfortunately, that's my, you know, on the other hand, we have some great, at least in America, we have some great social movements. You know, I think that we're becoming healthier in many ways in terms of accepting diversity more and, and so on and so forth. Um, so some of those, some of the social trends I think are positive and I hope they continue when I hope that we can reverse a lot of the other ones, right? I mean, global warming is probably my number one bigaboo, bugaboo, because if it turns out to be as bad as a lot of scientists are predicting, and if species extinction continues the way that it's going, we're gonna be dead. And if we're dead, it doesn't matter how good everything else is because we're dead and dead is bad. Yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. you can quote me on that one. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot there. I, we do frequently visit this conversation of how well things are going across so many markers at the same time we know that there is so much old code that needs to be archived and that we need to put the new codes in yes. and the Millennials and Gen Z have the responsibility to to take it all the burden on their back and put the action forward and get out of some of the old archaic ruts that Can I talk to them directly for a second please okay Millennials and Gen Z people, listen very carefully. 
in my parents' time, they said, oh, our children are going to have to bear the brunt and fix what went on. In my time, we're saying, oh, our children have to bear the brunt and fix what's going on, etc. But why didn't we? Why didn't my generation fix all of this? And the answer is that systems lock you in. If you decide, oh, I want to change the way the system works, understand that, that it's really hard to change a system from within because, for example, let's just use, let's just, let's say that we decide that money needs to stop being a thing and we need to find ways to distribute resources to people who need them whether or not they have the money to pay for them. As you are starting that movement, you need to eat. And since the movement hasn't happened yet, you need to work to earn money to eat because without money, you can't eat. What happens is, great, you go out, you get a job, you start earning money, and before you know it, you're 40 years old, and you have spent your entire life trying to build a career, and now you possibly have a family, and you might have children, and now, I mean, you can't afford to just give all that up and go live in a cardboard box because, etc. What happens is, is when you're trying to change a system, you actually have to give up the old system, and you don't necessarily have the new one in place yet. And I don't know that it's possible to change a world system. I'll just give one example, then we can get back to, to <laughs> I'll let you drive again. Um, but the one thing is that right now, virtually all of our definitions of wealth and success are growth measures, right? It's, oh, I'll get a 10% return on my investment. You wanna hear something insane? Here's something insane. They say that the, the population of Japan is gonna decrease by 30% in the next 30 years or so. And they're saying, oh my God, this is gonna be an economic catastrophe. Forget the economy for a minute. We have a situation where we have enough infrastructure to feed and clothe a certain number of people. In 30 years, we're gonna have that same amount of infrastructure, but we're only gonna have two thirds as many people. So in a sane world, we would be celebrating. We would be saying, look at this, we don't even have to do any extra work and suddenly everyone will be able to have 50% more than they have now. If you do the math, it comes out to 50% more. Right? Um, like, isn't that awesome and amazing? But the way that our economy is set up, where everything depends upon growth and this, that, and the other, we actually are saying this is gonna be a catastrophe. That's insane. That's seriously insane. But that's the way that our system works. And Gen Zs and Millennials, because I'm still talking to you, you're going to need to find ways of breaking that at levels that are so fundamental, you may find yourself asking questions like, like, does ownership at a distance even make sense? Like, right, you know, once upon a time, people only owned the stuff they could carry with them. And now we have, you know, a person like a Jeff Bezos who can own $160 billion or whatever his net worth is up to by the time this airs. And in a sustainable society that's a healthy society, does the notion of ownership include the, this ownership of some abstract thing thousands of miles away? Because apparently he owns most of Texas. Um, and that's a really important question that you're gonna have to ask and you're gonna have to grapple with if the answer is no, how do you overturn the people like Jeff Bezos who really, really care that they own all this stuff at a distance? Anyway, good luck with that. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this this speaks really deeply to how it can be tough to dig out of that that rut of old code and the system that we're birthed into is difficult to augment because we have to abide by so much of the code in that old system. So one of the keys here is to create a new mental map, create new code that obsoletes the old code. I keep coming back to this example of whoever, whatever Satoshi Nakamoto is and blockchain technology just coming in and just completely flipping over centralized systems onto their heads and inspiring people to care more about decentralized technology, about cryptocurrencies, about the potential that that has. So we need young people to decide to make new codes, bring them in that are so powerful that they just inspire and engage so many people to obsolete the old systems yeah. and go with the new ones. That's so, so well said. And we have a lot more to unpack on even just that subject, but let's keep Oh yeah, I could, I could jump in, because by the way, blockchain still assumes ownership. There's still an entire set of underlying economic assumptions to the notion of wanting, uh, to wanting any sort of currency, because currency has been one of the most amazing inventions of all of human history. It's been unbelievably powerful, and it's been unbelievably destructive, both. 
and we may have to give up some of the power if we want to avoid the destruction. And again, you know, it's, I wish it were my job. I'd fix things. <laughs> there's, there's, there's quite a bit that we can also learn from the understanding of just slowing down and thinking and not, uh, and not rushing uh, and uh, just wanting to make sure that the children that are born into the world don't have any uh, rotten roots in, within, the, within the nutrients of the tree so that they can blossom fully a lot of the a lot of the malevolences and violences and issues that we see that happen in the world today are a direct representation of our just rush and urge to want to you know populate with with people no matter what kind of an education or nutrient system that they get at their roots and also just quickly on the Japan example I think this is a very profound way of seeing things that we're so in the old way of thinking that we can't even see something like a population stabilization where we have uh, ownership of, like, like you gave an example of people that are very wealthy that own so many properties that, that they don't even use at times, but there's still people that sleep on the streets. How does that work? And then also, yeah, if we have the infrastructure in place, well, even if the population stabilizes and slightly declines in the developing world, it's also nice that we don't necessarily need to be sometimes constructing so much of property. There's so many interesting points to go off of that. And I also just, I really want to hit on Stever's journey because you are a very fascinating, multidisciplinary, polymathic thinker, and you're going to be unpacking tons of these interesting strategies for us. But I want to know how you got to where you are today. <laughs> I'm going to give you the highlights that I'm going to let you delve in. Um, I grew up in a, a many different places. My, my mother and father were hippie, sort of new age hippies. And for a while we lived in a 23 foot trailer with seven people kind of bouncing around the country starting psychic growth centers. I call that my traveling new age commune days. Uh, we settled, well, my parents got a divorce. I settled with my mother, then decided to move out to live with my father. My father did not, however, want to have me living with him. So we rented an apartment for me. I was 14 at the time. We rented an apartment for me right next to his house. So his house and little apartment next to it. And then he moved away and I decided to stay. So I became an emancipated minor, put myself through high school programming computers, went to MIT and got a computer science undergrad, which was very cool. Went out into industry, worked as a uh, well, went out into industry, worked as a programmer, then shifted into working as a trainer for a software and hardware company because I figured out that I did not have social skills and that I did not have communication skills. And I said, I must develop these. These seem to be important. And what better way to do it than to teach people things? So did that. Then the company I was working for, which had the best product on the market, started to go under. And I went to my manager and I said, how is it possible for a company with a product as good as ours to go under? And she said, ah, to understand that, you must understand marketing strategy. And I'm like, marketing strategy, what the heck is that? And she said, well, actually what I said was, how do I get to understand that? And she said, well, for that you need gray hair or an MBA. And I lived walking distance from Harvard Business School. So one day I just wandered down and said, hi guys, I want an MBA. And they said, okay, much to my extreme surprise. <laughs> so this little kid from the, literally from the wrong side of the tracks, remember those, pe those kids that your parents warned you about? That was me and my sister. We were the ones who they were warning you about. And I got in and I, rem I still remember to this day holding the acceptance letter to Harvard Business School. And because my boss had said, she said, you can always apply and if you get in, you don't have to go. And I remember sitting there looking at the acceptance letter thinking she's wrong. Like, I freaking got into Harvard freaking business school. There's no way I can say no to this. So did that for a couple of years. Uh, uh, when I graduated, moved out to Silicon Valley, worked for Intuit, the people who make Quicken and QuickBooks. Anyone out there, if you have the Quicken Visa card, my project. Um, after Intuit, my mother uh, came down with colon cancer and I took care of her for the last several months of her life. Uh, that was a rather taxing experience. At the end of that, I. I had moved back to Boston, um, spent a year playing, and I remember thinking many times, man, I have to write down all the things I did this year. This is such an amazing year. 
forgot to write any of them down. Um, so I know I had an amazing year, don't remember what, doing what. Then I was asked back to Harvard Business School to help them redesign part of the MBA curriculum. And I spent two years doing that, really delving into what are the skills that make leaders, what are the skills that people need to be able to think strategically, and then furthermore, how do you teach those? Because a lecture isn't going to do it. Mm -hmm. So I spent two years studying everything the human race knew about human learning theory, how people learn things, and how do you learn emotional things? Mm -hmm. Ask me later about the design of my ethics program. Mm -hmm. um, the faculty took one look at it, and they were like, no. They were just like, <laughs> absolutely not. Yeah. No way. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, lawsuit city. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, but better to do this in an academic environment where no one yeah. will get hurt. They're like, no. Yeah. They're like, we're going to talk to people about ethics. We are not going to do this design. So anyway, did that for a couple years, then spent a time as the chief operating officer of a startup, moved from there into organizational learning consulting and transfer of best practices. So if you have a big company and you have two units, one is doing really doing stuff well, the other one isn't. How do you model that and transfer it? Um, then joined another startup, then uh, was dissatisfied with that startup and through a not particularly interesting story became an executive coach because it became apparent by that time that I naturally sort of everyone around me, I made my mission to help them be more awesome and be more incredible and you know develop their skills to the max and get what they wanted out of life. So like, why not do this professionally? and had a coaching practice, which I've had for a long time now, which has been broken up by a few different periods of employment. Um, I was the president of a friend of mine's company for a little while. I also went back to Babson College and helped with, they were doing a strategy redesign when, when uh, they changed presidents several years ago. And I got involved with that. That was right before the 2008 uh, bubble burst. I also, did a three-year journey here where I tried, I, I, I hit a certain age, <clears throat> which we don't have to talk about. And I said, you know, I now have enough data to help figure out what makes life amazing because I'm a certain age. I went to Harvard Business School and MIT, which means all of the people who I went to school with, if anyone should have amazing lives, it should be those people. So I just called them all up and I said, where are you in life? How did you get there? Did you get there the way you thought you would? And what were the key things? And I basically came up with a list of things that seemed to correlate to having an amazing life. Nice. Put these into a TEDx talk, gave it at TEDx Mill River in, I think, Connecticut. They screwed the video up, so unfortunately it's not on the the, the TEDx site. However, I turned it into an hour-long presentation and I gave it at Harvard Business School um, like eight or nine times to standing room only. It was very cool. It's, it's a great speech um, and it is online on my website somewhere. I'm not sure, if, I'm not sure how easy it is to find, but it is there. Uh, but, but I did this three-year experiment. In that three-year experiment, I changed the rules of how I made decisions, and I did some stuff that even today, today, to this day, I'm kind of like, wow, that was really cool. So I started a little podcast, which became the number one business podcast on iTunes for, for many months. Uh, it has since dropped down in the ratings, but I've been doing it for 11 years now. Um, based upon the podcast, I got a book contract. This is going to be weird. Based upon the book contract, I was joking with a friend. I, for some reason, I just developed this spontaneous interest in musical theater. And I was talking with a friend as I was getting ready for my book tour. And I said, I said, you know, I'm really bummed about this book tour. And he said, why? And I said, because I suddenly want to be doing musical theater. And instead, I'm going to be going around talking about my book, which is a book on personal productivity. I said, like, wouldn't it be cool if I had a one-man musical that was based on my book? And it was like the world's first musical that's so dramatic that people cry, but so informative that people take notes. And, and it would all be about personal productivity. And he just kind of looked at me and he said, you do know what I do for a living, don't you? And I was like, yeah, you're a journalist. Because I thought he was a journalist. He's like, no, I teach musical theater composition and writing at NYU. And I was like, you do? And he said, yes. A week later, I finally got the courage to ask him, do you want to do this? I have no prior musical theater experience. I have never sung a song in my life. I don't know how to write a script. I have no idea how to write dialogue. Well, unfortunately, it wasn't done in time for the book launch. However, you can see the first five minutes, or you can see a five-minute teaser for Work Less and Do More, the zombie musical, which is the world's only musical that is so dramatic that you might cry. We actually toned that part down a little bit. And so informative that you'll take notes. 
and it is about a, a zombie, a, a general of a zombie army who's a human. His name is Steve Robbins, and he, General Steve Robbins, of course. And he went to Harvard Business School, and at Harvard Business School, they never invited him to the parties because they said he was a bad MBA. So the, all the other kids would have parties where they would eat Oreo ice cream cake, and they wouldn't invite him. So he decided that he was going to get back to them by raising a zombie army and cornering the world's supply of Oreo ice cream cake. So if they had parties in the future, they would have to invite him. That's what the musical's about. I mean, as musicals are, right? It's just, that's just one of those standard tropes. I mean, everyone writes the zombie general Oreo ice cream cake musical. And, um, and he ends up, boy, I don't know how much, I don't want to get deeply into the story, but basically, basically, Things don't go the way he planned, and it becomes both a very human story about how do we know what we really want and what do we really want, as well as a very informative story because it teaches you several productivity tips from my book. Um, I think that is the, num the thing I'm proudest of out of everything I've done in my life was that musical because it was so far outside anything I had ever done. It, oh. it changed my image of myself in a very major way. Um, and then uh, since then, I, uh, I have went back to executive coaching. I did some development of a workshop based on the Living an Extraordinary Life series, which ended up not coming to market for various reasons. And then uh, I'm, I've currently been doing something called Get It Done Groups, which are communities that help people finish things and develop new habits. And there's also lots of other stuff. Somewhere in there, there were six or seven other startups that I was involved in at various times. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, they, it all runs together. <laughs> what a story, especially nuts all the way from being a kid and, and traveling with your parents to the different, what was it, psych? psych well, we started Psychic Growth Centers. Psychic Growth Centers. Uh, and then living by yourself as an emancipated child, uh, and then learning. You can imagine how, how popular I was since I had my own apartment and all of my friends could use it to bring their dates over. I'm just saying. Sure, 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 <laughs> I, sure. I learned yeah. about the real world yeah. early Fast. in life. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can, yeah, I can see that. And then so, so it's also interesting that you ended up uh, teaching yourself how to program computers yep. and going to MIT and learning that, oh, wow, I should learn how to talk to people and I should learn more about uh, humans and behavior and cognition and all that good stuff. And so then the that whole transition with, with marketing strategy and how you ended up realizing that you could kind of, you kind of gave a nice little merger of those two worlds in a sense of the, of the, heavy programming side of things with a uh, business side of things with Harvard Business School and you like you made it clear too with Harvard with Babson for these different um, institutions if you're actually able to put together uh, programs that get people to understand that a lot of the business skills the social emotional skills that we learn um, uh, are through experiential learning. A lot of entrepreneurship is through experiential learning. And so how do you make curriculum that takes people out of textbooks and into eye-to-eye -eye contact, into relationships, into the nuts and bolts of that type of stuff? And all the way um, to the 550 episodes that you've done. Um, get it done guy. Get it done guy. And just the seven to nine minutes that you have to synthesize of, of how to best be uh, be productive, be able to put things together that you want to get done, overcome fear, all this type of stuff is just so critical and it's not just like a sub part of our lives. This is immediately applicable to every single part of our lives, yes. our family, our friends, our coworkers, our, our customers, and, and just every, the way we vibe even in the general public. All of these things come together, they coalesce. This is not just something about how to use a certain tool on a computer. No, 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 definitely. In fact, one of the things that I feel fairly strongly about is, is right now, you know, the there's an app for that concept. There's not actually an app for human relationships. No matter how much people want them to be, I find I find it hilarious that like all these dating apps, what do you enter? You enter things like what's your hair color? How tall are you? How much do you weigh? What are, maybe what are your measurements, you know, whatever. Why do you enter those? Because engineers, the least capable people in the world of forming relationships, generally speaking, 
do understand how to do numeric comparisons. Those are very easy to do in code. So of course they have you fill out a profile that's basically all the stuff that's easy for them to program. However, we actually know a lot, a whole lot about what makes people bond, what makes people fall in love, what, is, what goes for a compatible relationship. And let me tell you, it's not hair color, it's not how high, it's not how tall someone is, it's not what their measurements are, it's all kinds of other things, none of which any of the apps deal with except maybe, I mean, there's like some match.com that does sure. some psychological things. Yeah, but the psychometric profiles, uh, being able to know someone uh, better than the spouse of that person knows them based on their Facebook likes. Right. This type of stuff is nuts, building out these psychometric profiles. Um, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and start diving um, deeper into all of this. So your fascination with how people think, how yes. people reach their full potential, and actually realize that by working with with you, that they that they see themselves actually. Oh, I used to not like to try and call people to build a customer uh, relationship management uh, f funnel. Oh, all of a sudden, 12 week weeks later, oh, I love calling people. I love building out this funnel. It's like, hold up, hold up. Just three months ago, you hated this stuff. Yes. So these types of realizations are actually really important for us to slow down and realize, yeah, I've grown quite a bit. Like if you look at any of the episodes from you know a year and a half ago, it was gobbledygook, you know? And now, <laughs> yeah, now it's gotten a little better. It's like kindergarten interviewing class. Like I got a little better. And so it's yep. only, so it's good to slow down and reflect on that. But yeah, so this is everything from the organization organizational level to yeah. the people level. This is another critical thing that you help all the way from executive CEOs all the way to other people like in, a, in just their normal everyday relations. So, so to me, it's all tied together because human, so, so people, and it's, this is one of the things that always amazed me about organizational, a lot of the stuff in the organizational development and organizational change literature, is people treat the organization as if it is somehow separate and divorced from the people. It's not. I mean, people want to believe it is, but and, and, it, and in terms of performance, it sort of isn't. But if you want to change an organization, what it means to change an organization is it means there are human beings inside that organization who are going to have to behave differently when they come into work tomorrow. That's what it means to change an organization. It means you have to change the components, and it's made up of people. So to me, there's a very clear link between organizational process and big picture and how does an organization get where it wants to go and the micro things about people. Let me give you a specific example. Let's say that you have someone who's running a big company and uh, human beings have a tendency, and I'm gonna say tendency because it differs per person and it differs according to context. But some people are highly motivated towards a grand vision. Other people are highly motivated to fix things that are broken. And again, it's contextual. In one context, you may be one. In one context, you may be another. Let's say you have a CEO who is highly motivated to fix things that are broken. What they're going to ask for, the kind of information they're going to collect, is how many errors are we producing? What's going wrong? What, you know, what are the solutions you have to fix what's going wrong? But their whole orientation is going to be around finding errors and fixing them, which means they're going to hire people who can find errors and fix them, and which means their direction is going to largely be one of finding and fixing. Other side of the coin is you can have someone who's very much a visionary who says, oh, there's this giant castle in the air. Let's go there. And everyone says, oh, we can't go there. It's in the air. And they say, that doesn't matter. Build a ladder. And they're like, you can't build a ladder that tall. And they go, do it anyway. And sometimes everyone crashes and burns, and sometimes they make it there. And, uh, and which of those two people you have heading up your organization is going to determine who you hire, how you organize them, what things you measure, what things you manage, what do you even consider a threat in the marketplace, and what do you not consider a threat? And what I've found in startups, at least, and I suspect it's similar in big companies, although you know maybe less so, is most, well, most of the CEOs I have direct experience with, they tend to build an organization which, as an organization, is a psychological mirror of them as a person. And if they are good at, at at bringing in diverse points of view, at hearing bad news, at fixing things, and also at, at being a visionary or whatever, you can build an organization that's well balanced like that. Even if they're not like that, if they understand the importance of that, they'll assemble a team that has all those perspectives and they will you know, kind of allow it to do the things that is not in their normal personal style. But um, 
Uh, so that's organizations and individuals. And then within individuals, you actually have the same kind of thing. If you have somebody who habitually looks for what's wrong and tries to fix it, they're going to organize their personal life very differently from someone who makes, who makes ideas of what could be and pursues those. And you know, again, people don't necessarily think, oh, am I moving away from unpleasantness or am I moving towards things that are awesome? Or you know, choose your favorite adjective. You, you, you know, I always wanted to be enlightened. I've solved that one. I don't want to be enlightened anymore. Um, too boring. Um, <laughs> not really. But um, but if you if you to the extent that you can start to understand your behavior patterns and where you are get where which behavior patterns and which thought patterns give you what you want and which ones get in the way of what you want, there is a degree to which, and I don't believe it's as malleable as some people believe, but there's a degree to which you can rewire how you approach certain things so that you can make up for your natural deficiencies, or if you know where your strengths are, and actually even getting into the idea of what's a strength and what's a deficiency is a whole other question, um, because something that can be a strength can also be a weakness. It just depends upon where you're applying it, what you're trying to do. But knowing those things about yourself, you can either partner with people who compliment you, or you can seek to develop the other strategy, you know, the other side of, of the coin. So I always thought that I was kind of a visionary. I'm not. When I look empirically at my life, not a visionary. Um, I care a lot about the future. I'm a futurist, but I am much better at projecting trends than I am at coming up with a whole new vision of something that doesn't exist and saying, let's strive for that. Um, the thing that motivates me is fixing problems. So interestingly enough, a lot, you know, most of my Get It Done Guy episodes, 550 episodes, all of those episodes are how do I solve problem X? Mm -hmm. Because that's my skill set, that's the way that my brain thinks. Mm -hmm. And knowing this is really important for me to have people around who say, hey, we're going to build this wonderful tower. Because then I can say, oh, well, we're not there yet. The problem is we're not at the tower yet. And therefore, my brain just kicks into high gear and says, well, we have a problem. We must fix the problem. The problem is we're not at the tower. We need to build a really tall ladder. So I can still get there. I can get to the tower. But my brain gets to the tower by noticing that we're not there and fixing that problem, quote unquote. Whereas someone else's brain might get to the tower by looking at the tower and going, wow, I really want to be in the tower. And they're being motivated as a pull towards something positive. And you know, both of those thinking styles have different pros and different cons. Um, you know, I think I'd be happier if I were the other kind. I think, you know, because I'm always dissatisfied with the status quo. But uh, in both scenarios, what's key is to know what the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth, twentieth steps are, these milestones of building the ladder to yeah. get to a vision, whether it's solving a problem or living in a great world that has that update. It's just actually executing is worth so much more in the world. Ideas are everywhere. Every idea has to turn into action or else what's it good for, frankly? Yeah, and then on a, on a personal level too, there's so many skill sets that need to be better understood with psychology and behavioral analysis, how our brains work, the way that we socially and emotionally relate to each other, how we build rapport with each other, and doing things like neurolinguistic programming, NLP. This mm. is fascinating stuff. So, so yeah, wa yeah, walk us through all of these unique ways that we engage with each other on a human animal basis. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's a pretty tall order. <laughs> um, do you want me to talk about NLP or do you want me to talk like more generally and systemically? Because Yeah, give us general systemically and then boil it into yeah, some NLP too. Yeah, okay. So from what I've been able to tell of the way human beings behave is we, first of all, we're animals and we behave like animals. And I woke up one day and just suddenly started seeing it. I wrote, read a book on primate behavior and I was like, oh no, this explains far too much. <laughs> like, um, and we are, an we are social animals. And we are animals who, who have a lot of our brain devoted to connecting with and being part of a social tribe because, at least according to the book Sapiens, which I'm about halfway through right now, th the thing that made Homo sapiens sapien a successful, a successful animal and now at the top of the food chain was our ability to organize in groups. That is our survival advantage. It's not an individual survival advantage. It's a collective survival advantage, which by the way, and I, we didn't even talk about politics as one of the things that we were going to talk about today. So I'll just say one sentence, which is one of the trends I think is incredibly dangerous right now 
is in many different places we are driving towards an, a very individualistic mindset. Um, you know, like, like in the gig economy, everyone is expected to both do whatever their gig is, but also market themselves and also have a personal brand and get their name out there and all this thought leadership and all this other BS. The power that the, the corporations have a lot of problems, but the power of a corporation, the reason that we have this globe spanning economy and iPhones and, you know, and delicious foods that you used to not ever be able to get because there was no way to get them from here to there. The reason we have that is because we are much more powerful together than individually. And we're, we're like deliberately dismantling that. It is, I think it's just bizarre. You know, people are saying, oh, well now you have to be good at all these things. I'm like, no, I don't want Rembrandt to spend his time building a website and trying to market himself and establish a personal brand by writing thought pieces. I want Rembrandt painting. That's, that's the contribution Rembrandt can make to the world. So I like the idea of a world in which Rembrandt can spend all of his time painting because that's the thing that he can do that no one else can do. And like I said, we're kind of going in the opposite direction and we're doing that politically as well where we have the whole sort of neoliberal philosophy, which is, well, you know, if, if, if you're not rich or whatever, it's because you're a bad person, as opposed to having this understanding that maybe, but maybe it's also that there are systemic effects. That the know. roots have certain malnourishments. Right. And this is, as, as you were just explaining, the code here is that it is different for these seeds, their fruits that they actualize into the world. It's not putting everyone in the same, need to develop your personal brand, need to build a website. You need to have a CRM with a certain amount of people and a certain amount of revenue and a certain picket fence and a certain right. car. It's, we need well, to get past that. And it's also a DNA that's not just about the individuals, but it's about our communities. It's about the cultures we live in. You know, what I, one day I was at a business networking meeting there were 14 of us, all men. And as we were getting up to go, I looked around and I suddenly realized every single person in that room was wearing a powder blue button down shirt and khakis. And I burst out laughing. And they said, what's so funny? And I said, did you notice that we're all dressed identically? And we went downstairs and stood on the sidewalk and looked around to downtown Boston. And basically every guy who came within, who, 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 we, who we could see, who walked down any of the streets, they were all wearing a powder blue shirt and khakis. And I look at this and I go, we live in the richest, most successful society in all of human history in terms of our material standard of living, in terms of the options that are available, in terms of the technology we have, and we use it to, pr to produce a level of conformity and uninterestingness in our lives, in our clothes. Like, it's, it's really kind of amazing how, how completely bland we've made our existence. Um, and I, this was really, this really got, got pounded home to me three years ago when I went to Burning Man for the first time. And I looked around and I was like, oh, right, it doesn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. There are actually all kinds of dimensions of interestingness if we can just kind of get out of our little shell of believing. Like one of my favorites is, is you know, when people say, um, well, I'll just give you a real example. I was on Facebook one day and there was a Harvard Business School alumni meeting that was gonna go on. And I posted a thing to Facebook saying, I'm thinking of wearing jeans and a t-shirt to the alumni meeting tonight. Should I do that or not? And people are like, oh my God, if you don't wear a suit, people will never take you seriously. They'll never do business with you. You'll destroy your rebel love, all this stuff. And I was reading this and I was going, people are describing life destroying consequences because I choose to wear one piece of fabric rather than another one. You know what? I wore jeans and a t-shirt to that meeting. I was the only one who wasn't in a suit. No one cared. The people who normally talked to me, talked to me. The people who ignored me, continued to ignore me. The people who didn't hire me, continued not to hire me. The world did not end. And I was like, how is it possible that we have created a world in which wearing a t-shirt instead of a button-down shirt has any consequence at all, much less terrorizes all of these people who are, you know. And now, keep in mind, I was raised in a, in a traveling New Age commune, you know, wearing loincloths. So I'm not exactly a suit kind of guy. Um, These are the new codes, though, again, is being able to obsolete the old codes, see the new codes, put it into the old system, the new codes. This yeah. is so critical. Can you so take us into more on the social emotional intelligence, the NLP? Yep. Yeah, yeah. All right. So I, I figured out when I was, uh, I figured out actually in college that I didn't really have great social skills because I didn't have any friends, right? Other side of the tracks, all that stuff. So I read, uh, so I, I took every psychology course offered at MIT, 
thinking, oh, because I was a little nerd, right? I'm like, oh, well, you know, they must surely know how to make friends. Maybe there's a course on it. So I took psychopharmacology and I took this overview course where we learned about Jungian therapy and object relationship and Freudianism and transactional analysis and you know, all these different things. And I had one very simple criterion, which is that I wanted to be able to use what I learned to make friends with this person who we had established we wanted to be friends, but for some reason it just, we just didn't click. But we knew we kind of both wanted to be friends. None of it worked. None of it gave me anything useful. Mm. And then I read this book on neurolinguistic programming, mm -hmm. and I thought, this sounds so bizarre. I couldn't, it, this could never really work. And then uh, I took a class in it, a weekend workshop, and it taught just enough of it, because it's taught experientially. It's not taught, mm -hmm. you're not lectured. You actually do exercises. And I learned enough of it, and I went back to school, and I was able to sit down with that person and talk to them. And what I was using was a technique called predicate matching, which is a fancy way of saying if someone uses visual words, use visual words back. If someone uses auditory words, like they say, oh, that sounds like a good idea, use, use auditory words back. And if they use feeling words, they say, wow, I'm having trouble getting a grip on this, use feeling words back and say, wow, that's a really hard problem. We just begun to scratch the surface of it. And um, that was enough. Once I realized that I was mismatching the person I was talking to, I just switched into his sensory modality and boom, we became friends. And I was like, oh, this actually works, unlike all of the other stuff that, that, uh, you know, that, I, that I had learned about. And that was the beginning of my foray into NLP. And I started training in it. Um, NLP is rooted in hypnosis. And by NLP, I mean neuro-linguistic programming, not natural language processing. Uh, it's rooted in the study of a hypnotist named Milton Erickson, MD, who who I, I think is, I don't know if he's widely considered, but certainly, certainly he's considered to be one of the best hypnotists of all time, if not the best. And um, I gradually learned this, and I kept taking classes because I kept learning stuff I could really use, right? Like when you take a class on how to, how to change a belief. Well, that's actually useful as long as you take the time to notice which beliefs you have that are dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. And if you realize, wow, I've been sitting here believing that, that um, that I'm bad at math. I, this is actually a true story. I, I met somebody who clearly thought like a mathematician, but he was horrible at math because he believed he was bad at it. And I did the NLP belief change with him, and all of a sudden he could do math. <laughs> like it was just like boom. Um, and what did that look like? The belief change. Oh, I don't want to go into the. I mean, it. it Sometimes we sit down with scientists or entrepreneurs, usually not entrepreneurs. Sometimes we sit down with scientists. Entrepreneurs typically have confidence because they have to be willing to, uh, to be called insane yes. for pursuing what they're doing uh, in a marketplace. Scientists sometimes aim to become communicators at the edge, from the edge of their field, and they sometimes lack that, that confidence. And so, I, I would yeah. say more than sometimes. Yeah, um, yeah, and we desperately need them to become communicators yes. and get the objective reality down to more people. Yeah. yeah well, and also actually I would suggest it's not just about objective reality. It's about understanding if you want people to change their behavior, facts don't do it. And this is one of the things I find mm -hmm. hilarious about scientists. There's a lot of science. There's a lot of research showing that facts don't change people's minds. And so scientists who aren't interested in that particular fact, because scientists want to believe that facts change people's minds, scientists demonstrate the fact that facts don't change people's minds by refusing <laughs> to use anything except facts to try to change people's minds. And I'm like, dudes, do you understand? You are literally demonstrating that facts don't change people's minds because you scientists are ignoring scientific facts. Like, um, but in any event, that's one of my pet peeves because I think that w with respect to global warming, for example, I think scientists have done an unbelievably bad job of communicating this because they are so concerned with saying, well, you know, there was a 98.3872% chance that this could be caused by anthropological, excuse me, by anthropological global warning, warming with a 70 to 80% confidence interval, and maybe there is a range of outcomes which might include bad things happening 45 years from now. And I'm like, wow, I feel so persuaded. I'm like, dudes, look in the camera and say we're going to die. Miami is going to be underwater. The food chain will collapse. You will go to the grocery store and the shelves will be empty, except for the zombies, which will be singing songs about personal productivity as they <laughs> eat your brains. Um, yeah, I, I mean, scientists don't know how to communicate. Um, 
But to get to the question about fear, l let me tell you one of the basic tenets of, of NLP. And by the way, NLP is not is considered a pseudoscience. Let me be very clear about that. Um, the fact that I can use it to produce reproducible results does not mean the science has embraced it, interestingly enough. Um, my criterion is the results piece. I think neurolinguistic programming n is going to benefit greatly from our ability to create better neuroscience tools and yeah. then be able to literally map neural activity and be able to show re reproducibility oh. and then it yeah. is blatantly obvious that so it is actually about seven or eight science. years ago, I read this article in Technology Review, MIT's science magazine, that was talking about memory formation, the latest theories of memory formation. And one of them, one of the theories is that when you remember something, you can actually modify it while it's in short-term memory, and the modifications get written back to long-term memory. And, and um, the article ends with this thing saying, you know, the authors theorized that perhaps someday this could be used for the treatment of trauma. In 1978, the guys who created NLP put out a book called Frogs into Princes in which they had a, in which they have a technique called the fast phobia cure, or maybe it's the trauma cure, I forget which at this point. It's called visual kinesis, VK dissociation is, is the other name they use for it because it involves doing some fancy stuff with visual and kinesthetic stuff in your brain. And it works. Now we've never known why it worked, but as soon as I read that article about how memory was formed, I'm like, oh, this is the technique that operationalizes this. The problem is the scientists who figured out how memory works have never seen the technique. And the people who developed the technique, the people in NLP, knew nothing about the science. They weren't looking at the underlying science. They were just saying what seems to work, and they kind of figured it out by trial and error. So I've made a bunch of these connections. I'm not holding my breath for the rest of the world to make them. But in the NLP model of how people think, uh, and, th and there are other psychological models too, it's pretty much accepted that people you have thoughts and then you react to the thoughts as if they're real. So my friend had the thought, I'm bad at math. And as a result, he didn't even try to do math because he knew he was bad at it. He already had that belief. Your belief takes a certain form in your brain. It's either pictures that you're making or a voice where you're talking to yourself. So maybe he actually was saying to himself, I'm bad at math. Maybe he was making a picture of, of that math test that he got back in third grade with a big red X on it. But he had some mental thing going on that was, that was the representation he used to know that he was bad at math. The NLP belief change is first you have to understand and discover what that person's representation is. And a lot of times people aren't aware of what their representation is because it comes and goes so quickly. You're not, you're not aware of what your beliefs are constructed of. But when you're working with someone doing NLP, they can actually say, stop. What are, you, what are you picturing right this instant? Yeah. And it goes, oh, I see this picture of my second grade math test with a big red X through it. All right, wonder why that could have popped up when we were talking about being bad at math. Coincidence? Probably not. Mm -hmm. And so then there are techniques in NLP for actually changing that image. If once you're dealing with trustful people is another one of those things is that you, it's very important to get people to open up about their vulnerability. And it should have used the word vulnerable people, but sometimes people will lie blatantly to not show their vulnerability. And so rather than saying that I'm getting extremely furious and angry right now, uh, wait, wait, why are you feeling that way? Oh, well, you know, it's probably because I was beaten by my parents, right? It, 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 rather, it, it turns into a because you're an idiot. That's why I'm behaving this yeah. way. And so that's so it's it's a it's really difficult for even people to reflect back and even realize that something with the, between the ages of zero and six or something could have potentially led them to. And they may not even be aware of it. I mean, yeah. you know, they may genuinely be unaware of it. The vulnerability thing is interesting. Um, I seem to have no boundaries there which is kind of bizarre, you know, it, uh, let's just say this can cause some problems in my relationship because, you know, people can ask me f what, what apparently are very personal questions. I don't parse them that way. When, you know, if somebody says, if someone says to me, you know, why are you so angry? If I actually will stop and think about it, I go, oh, you know, probably because my parents used to beat me and this is like reminding me of that situation. So I think I'm kind of thinking that you're beating me up, you know, or whatever. Like, yeah, you know, that's, um, that's, that's, that's one of the ways which I would at that point have to literally pause everything and literally talk to you about that and, and try and you know, be there with you for that and for that experience uh, versus it's so weird that people think that saying when they say something that I'm feeling miserable right now and then they're like, oh, okay. 
<laughs> and then that 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 that's it. Um, also, the vulnerability uh, or just sheer openness um, on things like I I don't I don't subscribe to conformist mentality. So if I do see everyone wearing a suit, I'm gonna wear my DNA tree shirt. Right. You know, and if I do see that people treat sex as a taboo subject, I'm gonna walk in there and be like, why do heterosexual males not know how to perform oral sex on women properly, <laughs> right? Uh, and, so, and so these will right. literally be the things that I will breach conversations with purposefully because I want to shatter the taboo. I want to get there. And so some people will say, Alan, that's not okay for the for the um, for the boardroom. You know, that's not okay for the board, the suite, the sea level suite, or whatever. But those are sometimes the places, the United Nations, to be able to dose up on conversations right. like that would open people. So yeah. well, 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 look. I mean, if you want to say that's not the place where the board, you know, that's not a, a thing for the boardroom. Apparently, it is. If you take a look at the Me Too movement, <laughs> apparently it's been going on. Big people don't talk about it there, but apparently there's a lot of a lot of not good stuff that happens along those dimensions. And that's actually one of the, I mean, you know, you mentioned the sex thing, and, and I've always found uh, two things fascinating. And the first one came to me during Harvard Business School when I was there as a student, which is we learned about the entertainment industry, right, about movies. And, and the entertainment industry is a big industry. It's billions and billions of dollars every year. And at one point, one of the professors commented that the adult entertainment industry was much larger than the traditional entertainment industry. And I'm like, so how come we have 45 cases on Hollywood, and we have none on the porn industry. Now, you know, well, now, well, that's a taboo. Why, wait, why is it taboo? We're at a business school. That is a business that represents a significant fraction of the economy, and by the way, drives most technological adoption. Mm -hmm. Like, don't you think we should be studying that? Mm -hmm. Like, doesn't, you know, shouldn't we be talking about it? Maybe we should be putting, like, pictures of sex on our washing machines or something. Like, mm -hmm. like it, it struck me as amazing that this, this taboo, would override the purpose of the school, which is to under, yeah. like, like the reality is, it's an industry. Yes. And we probably should study it because that's, they have something to teach us. very interesting, yeah. You know, when you go outside and look around, within a couple of blocks, at least in a, in a big city, you can find a place to get food prepared according to your specifications of any ethnicity at certain levels of health, uh, uh, you know, of health standards and so on and so forth. We can do that with food, we don't do that with sex. We don't even talk about that. We don't do that with intimacy. We don't do that with our emotional needs. With our emotional like, needs, yeah. Like there's yeah. all of these human needs that we have. And you know, yeah, we've, we've got food and water down pretty well and also clothing and shelter. We've got those four. But there's this entire panoply of interpersonal needs that we have, of, of needs for validation, needs to feel good about what we're doing. And you know, and I have a great question so, for this, for, yeah. the, for this segment specifically. So then how would one be able to apply something like a neuro-linguistic programming in order for them to be able to talk to their boss about how they feel at work? How to talk to their spouse or their partner about how they feel in their relationship? Talk to their parent about something. So I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna go with NLP because, so just, just to give you a little bit of context, um, I, I, am now, I am now have taken some form of training in 45 different schools of personal change work. Okay, so I like it. So NLP is one school of personal change. Yes. So out of all of the executive coaching, there's 45 plus of these schools of personal change. So teach us about how, which schools of personal change would you apply to these scenarios? It's called The Work of Byron Katie. And it's marketed primarily as spirituality. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, maybe it's spirituality. I don't know. I'm not a particularly spiritual person. It is definitely the most powerful psychological technique I've ever encountered. And again, I judge these by whether I can produce consistent, repeated results with it. And the work of Byron Katie is you identify the, the internal dialogue and the things that you say to yourself and the beliefs that you have that are driving your behavior. So let's say you're afraid to be vulnerable with your boss. First thing you would do is you'd say, why am I afraid? Mm -hmm. What, are the re what, what am I afraid will happen? And you would write down on a piece of paper, I am afraid if I'm vulnerable with my boss, I will get fired. Whatever, 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 mm -hmm. whatever. And by the way, Get It Done Guy episode number 15 is the one I actually interviewed Byron Katie in that episode mm -hmm. and she did a role play with me. Uh, but it's, um, you write down all these statements. So if I'm vulnerable with my boss, I'll get fired. If I'm vulnerable, if I'm vulnerable with my boss, um, 
I'll never get promoted. If I'm vulnerable with my boss, they'll yell at me, whatever these are. And, and you, get, you, you write down the ones, like you really identify the things you're really feeling. Don't, don't whitewash it because if you, you need to get the, the actual thoughts that are causing you the distress. Yeah. Then you do her process, which is called The Work. And if you're interested, you can go to thework.com. And somewhere on that site, there's a re actually, if you go to stever.me, so stever.me, stever.me forward slash The Work, that will redirect you to the page on her site that has all of her free downloadable resources. You can teach yourself to do it. The trick is not the trick is not learning the technique. The trick is actually sitting down and doing it. And it's not necessarily easy because digging into the depths of your own right. psyche. And you have to be honest with yourself. Yeah. So like one of the questions you ask, so let's say that let's say that the thought that I have is if I'm vulnerable with my boss, I'll get fired. One of the things you look at is you say when I believe that, how do I behave? So what are the things that I do as a result of that? And that's one of the places that you have to be genuinely honest. So well, when I believe that if I'm vulnerable with my boss, I'll get fired, I lie. I say things that I think will make me look good, even though I know they're not true. I try to belittle people around me, even if they did good contributions, because I want to build myself up and build them down. I, I feel superior to people after doing that. Like you actually go through all of those things that you would never want to admit about yourself. And you don't have to admit them to anyone else, but you have to, you have to admit them to yourself for this technique to work. And then you, you go through, I mean, that's one of, one of the steps. It's like f four or five different steps, uh, four or five steps to the technique. But I have, I've used it extensively several thousand times because I've actually kept track of my own inner work that I've done. And uh, I have found that if you take the time to do it, and it can take a while, like if you're afraid to talk to your boss, if you're vulnerable with your boss, you might have 15 or 20 beliefs that are related to that. That might take you, take you a couple of hours at night to go through. However, you take the time to go through them, and in my experience, the next time you think, if I'm vulnerable with my boss, I'll get fired, instead of having a horrible fear reaction, you'll think, huh, I wonder if that's actually true. Can I find some evidence for or against so that I make a wise decision? But if I decide to be vulnerable with my boss, I'll just go do it. It's you're, amazing. You're, you're, you're titrating a honest conversation with yourself about the deepest parts of your own psyche. Yes. That's a great way to, to, to put it, even for something that, uh, for me, has been really tough to be able to work with some of the mentors that have been helping me and identifying myself as greedy. And I'm just like, yeah, actually, I have been acting that way and prioritizing my own desires when I'm attending your organizational events. I'm trying to run in there like a kid and gather all of the coolness of the powerful nodes instead of representing someone that is trying to be selfless, that is trying to to prioritize the needs of other people first, of a higher cause than myself. So you this have- This type of stuff. Yes, and there may be a belief under there that being greedy is bad. Yeah. So if I were doing the work, I would not only do the work on I'm not greedy, because probably what you're thinking is I'm not greedy, I'm not greedy, I'm not greedy. So I would do the work on I'm not greedy, but I would also do the work on being greedy is bad. Mm -hmm. And that won't make you, it won't necessarily make you believe being greedy is good, but what it will do is it will remove enough of the charge that you can really sit down and think, well, is it bad? And what the answer you'll probably come to is in some contexts, yes, in other contexts, no. And, you know, and so I want to pick and choose where I'm greedy and how I'm greedy and what I'm greedy about, you know, I mean, you know, and even what it means to be greedy. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's all nuance. And I think yeah. that some sort of a self actualization and transcendence, it kind of hits all of those things because then it's just a state of flow of just having the new code that you're trying to augment civilization with just, just channel through you and yeah. not on behalf of you so that you can achieve some sort of a status, blah, blah. Yeah. Well, you know, and, I, and, and I'll say, keep in mind, number one, you're still living in a, you're still living in a system where status matters. And, you know, and if you want to make the better code updates, status helps you push out those code right. updates. These, this is where the nuance really helps. And I, I do agree with so, where you're going. So by with. the way, actually, yeah. so speaking of status helps, what, here's one of my pet peeves, and I have a lot of them. Uh, but one of my pet peeves is frickin' billionaires, all right? Now, maybe not in the way people think. 
because I have heard Bill Gates and Warren Buffett both say, oh, income inequity, it's so horrible that it's happening. How can we fix this? How can society fix income inequity? Now, both Bill Gates and Melinda Gates have given interviews that I've read. I haven't heard them, but, but I've read two interviews with both of them where they were asked, do you think we need systemic changes? And both of them said no. And this was almost like an Onion headline, right? Man and woman who have benefited from current system more than 7 billion, 900 million, 999 thousand, 999 other people think current system is working just fine. So to begin with, the fact that they said no tells us nothing except they're, they're really benefited from the current system. <coughs> Warren Buffett says, oh, income inequality, this should be fixed. Gee. Now this is where we go from the organizational and the societal perspective down to individual behavior, when this is what we were talking about before, about how we have systems that are made up of other systems. It's very easy to use this broad word like income inequality. And in NLP, that's something we call a nominalization, which is we're taking something that's a concept and treating it like a noun, but it's not a noun. It's, a, it's just an abstract idea. So in NLP, what we're taught is when you hear a nominalization, it may be useful to say, what specifically does this mean? Mm -hmm. So income inequality, what specifically is income inequality, right? And it's like, oh, well, some people are paid more than others. So then you can say, really, how specifically, because that's another NLP question, is, is you say, how specifically are some people paid more than others? Here's the answer. Someone decides to set their salary at a certain rate. That's the answer. Who decides that? Managers, HR departments, the owner of the company. That would be Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. So when I hear them complaining about income inequality, I'm like, Warren, dude, you're the second richest man in the world, or maybe the third at this point. I don't know, I don't know exactly where he is. Pick up the frickin' phone. I know you have one. Pick up the phone. Call your 14 operating companies that collectively employ 300 or 600,000 people and say, give everyone a raise. Like, you're actually the problem. You are the person in the system who can make that happen, and you don't do it. Why? Because Bill Gates believes the system works fine. So the idea of examining who in the system is behaving incorrectly doesn't occur to him. Warren Buffett believes the system works fine. So then potentially so. one of the solutions is to have a, the deep, it's a deeper spiritual understanding of the oneness and the unity. That way it doesn't feel like there's actually a, some sort of a top-down governmental pressure or a bottom-up grassroots revolution, but just a really deep reflection on spiritual actualization and transcendence that says, hey, we have 1,500 billionaires. Maybe if we all just realize that we've benefited so greatly for the system, let's figure out how to raise the pay of all of the employees that we employ. And it's, well, it's, but it's, the thing is, it's not even figure out how. We know how. We know how. <laughs> and, and, we just pick up the phone and we say, give everyone a raise. We also need to run a simulation of what it's like to increase the amount of pay for all of the people. Because I'm just, I'm trying to understand. Except that we don't. Because we used to have a living wage, like so. So, 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 so to me, this makes sense that that the just the sheer amount of you know out of out of the total amount of money that the company is is taking as profit, if that out of that total amount of profit, if the company is choosing to pay its couple uh, owners of the company the most amount of that profit and even potentially an egregious amount of that profit compared to the employees compared to the other staff at the organization compared to redistributing it to its community that it resides in um, compared to taking on some of the challenges around the world with some of the extra profit buying a fifth boat or a fifth house etc so these sorts of ways of analyzing what is actually happening to that profit and doing things like, okay, if I eliminate two of the boats and I have three boats instead of five, I can take that additional money and distribute $1,000 per month each to the, to the 10,000 people that I employ. 
Right. Okay, so that type of math makes sense, right? So we want to follow math like that because it kind of makes sense. And then what we see simulated out is that I continue making enough money to buy three boats and stuff instead of five. The people that are making $1,000 more per month are able to live healthier, happier, more effectively in their communities with their children, get better educations, this type of stuff. The overall quality of health goes up. So, so it does seem to definitely make sense. It's just that we, 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 we get all weirded out by the grassroots political revolution or the top-down governmental pressure. It has to, it just really does, we kind of, with the root systems, if we could have just gotten it to be a little bit more of a spiritual realization, we probably wouldn't even necessarily have the so, 1,500 right. billionaires if it was from the spirit. Well, if it's, if it's, yeah, I mean, if people, so I, I find this notion that, that the simple fact that someone owns the stock in a company entitles them to everything produced by all the people who do the work. Like, like I'm willing to say, sure, people, you know, Bill Gates should profit tremendously from creating Microsoft. That's reasonable, like I have no problem with that. Even though but, a venture capitalist well, is to put up the funding for the organization to scale and whatnot, it still requires the hundreds to thousands yeah. of employees and the, hun and the thousands to tens of thousands, the hundred thousands of customers around the well, world. So let's, right, yeah. and let's, let's look at the actual math. I did this math recently. Bill Gates' net worth is about $90 billion. The median income for a family of four in America is about $60,000. Do the division, and you will discover that Bill Gates has enough money to support a median family of four in America for a million years or more. Now, that's 10 times as long as our species has existed. It's really hard for me to come up with any philosophical system of economic justice or wealth distribution that says one man should, that one man has somehow contributed as much as a family of four would contribute in a million years. Like, sorry, that, you know, that to me, that is so far out of whack. And again, y you know, that doesn't mean capitalism is bad, by the way. Capitalism has done some amazing things and does do amazing things. But, but one of the things it doesn't do well is distribute the spoils of capitalism. So basically, I'm actually a fan of capitalism for the kinds of problems that capitalism solves. But one of the things it doesn't solve very well is wealth distribution, not in the absence of certain types of government regulation or just a certain moral code. And this is one of the things that I love about Burning Man, because Burning Man has something of a different ethos, and it's a gift economy, which I think is much closer to how people actually evolved. And it, it, spending time there really makes you realize that, this is, that there is a different way of doing things. Whether it could be scaled up to the size of the world, don't know, possibly not. But it at least opens up the mind enough to go, you know what, we have alternatives. Yeah, that's so critical. That's that new code and being able to have a little simulation of that new code at Burning Man and all these different little mini burns that happen around the world is critical for mind expansion. Um, I, wanna, I wanna get us into um, some, of these, some of these ideas around human behavior, cognition, around social emotional not, uh, intelligence, as well as even to the way that we've need to update some of the old code. We've been updating code with technology. Technology has been this thing that we think comes in and just does everything well all the time. Then people said, no, 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 it's double-edged, double-edged, even though it's always been double-edged. Fire killing, fire cooking and providing light, right? There's always this double-edged. Now we've, I think, finally awakened to how we are using technology in ways that are completely, potentially, can annihilate the entire planet. Mutually assured destruction, rampant synthetic biology or super intelligence that is not aligned with the goals of humanity. So finally, we've learned that we have to test technology. So I want you to, 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 to teach about how you teach people that you work with about how to test the technology because sometimes we confuse hijacking with productivity. Oh, we sure do, we sure do. People, the most common thing people say is, you know, what's the app I can download for X? And the answer is maybe there's not an app. Um, so let me give a couple specific examples and I'll talk about what I recommend people do. So one, uh, I love the fact that people prefer to send email 
to, to talking on the phone. Because last time I checked, I've never met a person who could type faster than they talked. Talking on the, if you want to be productive, pick up the frickin' telephone and call someone. Now, if people say, oh, but then we talk for 45 minutes, well, okay, your problem is you don't know how to have a brief phone call. The problem is not that email is a better medium. Email is a great medium for, in, for certain kinds of information where people need to see a document or they need to have a record of something. But if what you want to have is a conversation, email sucks. In fact, anything that requires typing sucks. I can type 120 words a minute, and it still sucks because I can talk 300 words a minute. So in terms of actual productivity, for example, that's a big one. Now, most people are afraid of talking on the phone these days. And what anyone under 30 does not remember is there was a time when the only way you had to communicate was by phone. There were not internets, there were not cell phones, so a truck driver would stop at rest stops and actually call in to say, here's where I am, and that's how they would track their progress. Everyone used phones all the time. And this notion of, oh, I have phone anxiety. No, you didn't, because if you had phone anxiety, you, you died because you couldn't perform the basic tasks of daily living. And now that we have all these other things, the, the problem with a lot of these technologies is their crutches. You now don't have to deal with learning how to respond in real time to another human being because you can type and edit and not have to deal with their response. If you don't like it, you can just delete the message without reading it. Or you, I mean, this, these, are, these are actually bad things because, well, well they're, they're bad things in the hands of people who don't have the social skills developed. And People under, people under 25 now don't even know that there are social skills to be developed because they've grown up doing this kind of thing. I mean, I've, I have, I have had, so I've worked closely with some people who were like, like who are currently like in their early, really early 20s, like 21, 22, and it's amazing. They, they've never lived in a world where this wasn't the bulk of a lot of their social communication, and they're not functional human beings. I hate to say that. If you're that age range, get a life. Put your phone down for a year learn how to deal with other people. I had to do that. I did that at the age of 20 because I didn't have social skills and it was not easy. But boy, is it worth it. Because whether we like it or not, our brains are hardwired to be social. They're hardwired to respond to other people in a way that an app just can't, can't do. And maybe, you know, the funny part is people say, oh, well, we'll have virtual reality and it'll be just like someone standing there. I'm like, we already have regular reality. We have infinite resolution. Every color you can see, it's available. Just put your frickin' phone down and look around. There it is. You now have real reality. And there's a real live person right there. Respond to them. Let's give these examples of the book versus the ebook. Oh god, yes. So there's already there's already some a bunch of research on this. You remember things better if you read them on a paper book. Now, they don't know for sure why, but the current theory is that with a paper book, you're not just remembering the content that you read. You're remembering where on the page the content was. If you're holding the book open like this, you're remembering, oh, this was really thick, this was really thin, because it was the beginning of the book. There's a, it engages far more of your brain than, than an e-reader. And there's all these things, like even just the cover of the book, all becomes associated with the content in the book. So when you need to retrieve it, you can kind of remember any of those things. Because like, people will even say, I remember where on the page it was. It was like in the upper left-hand corner of the page or whatever. These are all keyed into how your memory works. And I actually have a, there's a way that I understand how memory works that I don't know if it corresponds to what science currently has, has proven or has shown, but it's kind of what I've synthesized out of all the different self-help things that, um, that I've learned. But basically, I believe you memory I believe that, that when you remember something, what you actually remember is everything that was going on in your body and your mind at that moment. So you remember the background sounds, you remember the, the color of the walls, all of that is in there. And that's how your brain keeps it separate. Because it remembers the stuff that you the stuff that you wrote in your notebook taking notes, the day that you wore the blue pants is a separate memory from the stuff you wrote in your notes the day you wore the red pants. And you're not consciously aware of that, but your brain actually, I mean, that's part of how your brain tells those two memories apart. And if everything is the same, the more that's the same, the harder it is for your brain to retrieve the information. So on a physical book, different physical books are different. They're different sizes, the different page layouts, different fonts, etc. But it's consistent within that book. So all of those things become associated at some level with that book. And again, this is my theory as to why this is the case. With an ebook, Every single thing is either variable or the same as all the others. Mm -hmm. Every single book you read is, is, is the same frame, the same thickness. Um, in fact, with the Kindle, at least the, with the, the Kindle app, I don't, I've never used a physical Kindle, 
you scroll, so it's the same information isn't even at the same place on the screen each time. And it, you might change the font, in which case now everything is all scrambled from where it was the last time you looked at it. And so, even when you're watching a YouTube video, that the YouTube video is always on a two-dimensional flat surface and that there's never any additional senses that help you with understanding the information that are augmented. It's never like, now pause the video and go and actually perform this activity in the physical world where you engage your sense of eyesight and smell and touch, yeah. taste. And that way you can better retain the information. Right, you know, it's retention, it's even thinking ability. I mean, we think with more than just our like abstract thought. Like, like I think they've shown that, that your entire body can be involved. In, in the way you store and access information. This and is probably actually great for the show, to, for people to try as the speaker that we're featuring is teaching things, to pause and to reflect and engage on the knowledge that is yeah. actually being taught. Something else, and I, yeah, I don't know if this works on video. So one of the things they have shown is that when two people are talking face to face, they are engaged in, th there's what I'll call kind of big chunk mirroring, right? Like you nod your head, I nod my head. Those are very big, big mirroring chunks. Mm -hmm. I've also read some research that says that people are engaged in very, very rapid, like faster than can be consciously detected, micro movements and things. I don't know if that's, mm -hmm. I, I, I wish I could remember the source of the research, but basically that when you're face to face with someone, you're actually engaging on more levels and faster with a feedback mechanism than you could even do over video because there's a time lag with video. Yeah. And with things like Skype, you have to look at the camera if you want them to see you making eye contact, but then you're not looking at them. It's actually different, and it's yeah. not the way your brain is wired to yeah, yeah. understand it. And do you know the th about the multitasking research, by the way? It teaches us. The, the, well, basically, multitasking turns your brain to mush. Um, well, one thing that one can say about uh, doing this thing of this task switching is that there is a, op there's an opportunity cost. There's a switching cost. There's when you focus on one thing at a time, you really get to dive deeper, fire, wire, focus. When you switch between, it takes you a piece of time to be able to really kind of get into a flow state of doing yes. that other task. But this is even different from that. This is actually just trying to do multiple things at once, like be on your phone while you're carrying on a conversation. Not only, not only can you not do it at any level of quality, but it actually degrades your ability to think. It actually makes, it, it shortens your attention span. At Stanford, uh, this was a few years ago, you can just Google Stanford multitasking. What they found was they were asking the question, do people raised in multitasking, do they develop the cognitive ability to do that? And the answer was no. In fact, they, they are degraded just as much as in people who weren't raised that way. So multitasking doesn't work. Um, sad but true. We have so much more to unpack about all of these things. And there's just a lot of wisdom that you've accumulated in your life that I'm just, I'm so grateful that we're able to sit down and talk about it now. And when we do round two, we're just gonna be able to jump deeper and deeper into all of the nuance here and hopefully have more and more um, items for people to, to embody and practice. Oh, yeah. Um, couple quick questions on the way out, Steve. Our first question is, what is a skill that you think every child should know going into the exponential technology age? How to identify and challenge your limiting beliefs. Beautiful and succinct, I love that. Are we in a simulation? No. No, we're not. I'll ask you more about <laughs> why next time. Sure. What's the most beautiful thing in the world? Community and a functioning ecosystem and planet. Steven, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Greatly appreciate it. Thank huge you for thank having you. me. Huge thank you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Check out Steven's links below as well. Go and share more thoughts like this around the world with our coworkers, our friends, our families online. Go and have more conversations about con what we talked about with Steven today. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you soon. See you soon. Peace.